Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us for today's town hall. I'm Marlena Holden, Director of Communications and Marketing for University Health Services, and I use she, her pronouns. I'm also an alumna of UW-Madison. The three people you're about to hear from today are people I've been fortunate to work with daily this past year. Their expertise in public health and mental health have been a lighthouse for me and many others during the COVID-19 storm. I'm so lucky to call them colleagues, and I learn something new from the three of them each day. Please welcome Amanda Jovog, Director of Prevention and Campus Health Initiatives at University Health Services. Amanda is a trained epidemiologist with more than two decades of experience. During the pandemic, Amanda led the data efforts around COVID-19, including the highly visited UW-Madison COVID-19 data dashboard. We also have Dr. Sarah Nolan, Director of Mental Health Services at University Health Services and a licensed clinical psychologist. Sarah has provided guidance to campus on the mental health impacts of COVID-19. I'm glad she's here today to share some of her wisdom. We also have Dr. Ajay Sethi, Associate Professor of Population Health Sciences and Faculty Director of the Master of Public Health Program and an infectious disease expert. Ajay serves on several campus-wide COVID-19 committees. Before we move forward with our discussion, I want to first acknowledge that the land that UW-Madison inhabits is the ancestral home of the Ho-Chunk Nation, one of the 12 First Nations of Wisconsin. We invite you to learn about the indigenous communities that have called this land home since time immemorial. By acknowledging our past, we are able to move toward a shared future. These truths are part of the Wisconsin experience and we honor them today. This is the first of three scheduled town halls for the summer and we hope the conversation will help answer questions that have been on your mind. The questions reflect those that have come in from the campus community through the COVID response box, from deans and directors, from HR and elsewhere, and they're questions a lot of us have grappled with ourselves. I would like to thank our partners at McBurney Disability for captioning and interpretation today. You can find links listed in the event description below this video for those services. I also wanna remind people that UHS is offering free COVID-19 vaccines at the main UHS clinic, located at 333 East Campus Mall. This is for all UW-Madison staff and students. We're also offering the vaccines at no cost for any community members, including children ages 12 to 17. This Friday, June 18th, UHS will also offer a pop-up clinic at the Cole Center from 8.30 to noon and 1 to 3.30. All right, thanks again to Amanda, Ajay, and Sarah for being here. During this session, we will focus on where we are now, knowing that everyone watching has gone through their own journey of loss and the unknown these past 16 months. This has been a difficult time for all of us, and for some, the transition to post-pandemic life feels fast. This is what we will talk about today, the science and psychology around what post-pandemic life can be like. So let's get started. I'm gonna direct our first question to Sarah. Sarah, a lot of us have spent most of the past 15 months taking a lot of precautions against COVID-19, from staying home as much as possible, limiting our contact with others, wearing a mask, and caring for loved ones in different ways. It can feel scary to begin to think about putting those precautions behind us. Sarah, how can people start to make sense of the uncertainty and fear that some are feeling? Thanks, Marlena, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, six minutes past the hour. Um, I really appreciate this question. I think that it's on a lot of our minds. I think um, we all are experiencing different levels of anxiety or fear around a number of um, things that are related to returning to um, life before COVID. Um, I think one really important thing to keep in mind is that in March 2020, we all very suddenly had to go into this new way of doing things. We left our offices, we left our schools, we changed our lifestyles fairly immediately. And it didn't give us the chance to sort of build all of this fear and anxiety around the change because we just didn't have time. This is different now. We now have this opportunity to sort of prepare for the return to office, the return to schools, the return to restaurants and, and life outside of COVID. Um, and I think that what comes with that, even though a lot of us like the idea of being able to prepare for things, what comes with that is some anticipatory anxiety around what is this gonna be like? Um, there is a lot of grief uh, that people are feeling over the last year and a half um, from the loss of loved ones, the loss of lifestyle. Um, and so, in some ways it feels like, well, as we return to what the normal used to be, shouldn't we feel good about it? But the reality is there's a lot that we got used to and 
you know, we're sort of attached to our lifestyle now. It, it sort of saved us or was a haven for us in order to survive COVID in some ways. And so I think returning to um, a life that is different is going to be a big adjustment for people and it's going to be really scary. Uh, from my perspective, it's really important for folks to get in touch with themselves in terms of what are you afraid of? Um, what is your anxiety or your fear based on? Is it a health risk? Is it a loss of something? Um, and really kind of trying to understand what, what the personal experience is, what the personal fear is, so that you can start to make sense of it for yourself. Talking to friends and colleagues and, and family members about that is gonna help you process that. Um, and, and my hope is that we can create um, kind of collegial atmospheres on campus where we can have those conversations because this is gonna be different for all of us and there are ways that we can support one another as this moves forward. Thank you, Sarah. Just one more follow-up question to that. Are you hearing some of the same questions and concerns from both students and staff and faculty across campus? Yeah, students, faculty, staff, um, I think most people in my life, uh, actually, and I think, you know, a lot of us, me, myself, you know, we're having these, these thoughts about what's it going to be like? How am I going to feel? Is it going to be scary to be in hallways with people? You know, right now, if we go into the office, those of us who have been going into the office, bathrooms are less populated, kitchens are less populated, um, buses are less populated. And there's a lot of fear that's that's based in the health risk that we've been sort of preparing for. Um, and so I think that is a, a shared experience. And I think that can be part of what can help us get through this, because I think finding empathy and compassion for one another and trying to understand that, you know, folks have, all of us come from different backgrounds and have had different experiences in our lives that are going to shape the way that we're seeing this transition. Um, and so just trying to keep that in mind that we're all sort of in this together, trying to move through this together. And we each have our own, you know, kind of backpack of stuff that, that we carry through this world that's going to impact the way this, this experience goes for us. Thank you. Um, and you know, one of the things that hopefully can help combat the fear is when we talk about what's safe, I want to go into a little bit about uh, more about how we can feel safe. So let's talk about vaccines for a little bit. Um, we keep hearing that vaccination keeps us safe, but how do we know that? Um, Ajay, do you mind taking that question first? Uh, sure. Thanks, Marley. And, uh, and again, I'm, I'm also happy to be here. Um, you know, one thing it's important to sort of no, is that you know there isn't like an established correlate of protection something we refer to as like a blood test like we don't have some kind of measure in the blood after somebody is vaccinated to tell them if they are protected or not so really we have to take sort of a leap of faith and that, and that leap of faith is in science and so far the science you know comes from studies in large groups of people you know from the clinical trials uh who were who volunteered to test to see if the vaccines were effective. Uh, and also the millions of people now who have received the vaccine in the six months of the rollout. And the research that has been carried out for almost a year now continuously shows you know, that the vaccines are indeed highly effective, that they're very safe. Uh, and we see epidemiologically case rates coming down and hospitalization rates down and deaths also declining. And that epidemiology is pretty much exclusively in people who are unvaccinated. So if you are vaccinated, you can take that leap of faith in science and feel confident that if you're exposed to the virus, you're not likely to you know, experience any of the worst outcomes of COVID. Thank you. I'm going to ask Amanda to talk to this a little bit. You know, Ajay has this broad sense. And Amanda, you, you've really been looking at the campus efforts around this related to vaccination and, and cases when they were earlier. Um, what are your thoughts about this? Yeah, um, yeah, I really appreciate uh, everyone. Good to see everyone here. Um, and um, thinking about what Ajay said, I think for me, I'm looking a little bit more specifically at the cases both on campus and around the community to understand what's happening here. And what I can say is that the number of cases among those who are vaccinated has just been falling and falling and falling. It, it's actually an unusual day that I see a case among um, a vaccinated, a fully vaccinated person at this point. Um, and so it, it, that that 
process alone gives me a lot of a feeling of safety. You know, I think it can it can seem really theoretical at first, putting this vaccine uh, in your arm when I first had to do it. With, you know, it is it is a leap of faith in science, but seeing the proof in our communities. Um, seeing the rates among people who are 65 and older um, drop dramatically, the hospitalizations among those groups, as they were the first groups who have been uh, more fully vaccinated, um, has just been incredibly reassuring to me um, as we've moved through the past few months. Thank you. And, and can you speak a little bit more about why there is less risk now than there was in March or April of 2020? What's changed? Sure. Um, so when I, th I mean, the biggest change, of course, right now, the rates of um, of COVID in our community are, I guess I should say the rates of confirmed cases in our community right now are, are about the same as we saw in early spring last year. Um, the situation, however, couldn't be more different. Um, we, the, the biggest change is that it's the fact that both our natural and vaccine induced immunity levels in the population are so much higher. When, when this was happening in the spring, th there was no one with any, um, with or very few people with any immunity um, in our communities. Um, and now those rates are incredibly higher. But sort of the strongest proof for me was, as I was thinking about this question over the weekend and looking around you know, my community as I went around this weekend, businesses were open parties were happening. Life was going on in ways that we really were not doing last spring and summer. Um, and, the and the rates are staying low. Hospitalizations are at the lowest level. And that's with all of this in-person interaction happening. It, it really makes me feel um, secure in the immunity that our vaccines have given us. So I want to go back to something that Sarah touched on earlier about, you know, going back into the office, you're also seeing that things are less populated, like break rooms and the bath bathrooms and other shared spaces. But what would you say if you're being asked to work in a space where not everyone is vaccinated or you don't know the vaccination status of people around you? And I'll let Ajay or Amanda go um, start with that one. Ajay, do you want to take that one first? Um, yeah, sure. So I'll say that the key thing is, is whether the person asking that question themselves is vaccinated or not. And if somebody is vaccinated, they, they can feel very confident that they aren't going to be a source of spread of the virus, uh, that if they were to become infected, that they're really not going to have any symptoms. And if they did, it, they would be very mild. Um, but if somebody who's unvaccinated wants to know sort of what are those vaccination rates, around them at work or in their community, it's an important question to ask because when you have a lot of unvaccinated people in a given place, and if somebody has the infection and they're maybe infectious, uh, you have that chance for spread to occur. Um, and as long as uh, there are very few people who are unvaccinated, we just won't expect you know, outbreaks to be occurring in a, in a given environment or in a community. And that's what the vaccine rollout has been all about, was to try, is to, try to get as many people as possible to choose vaccination. Uh, it helps the unvaccinated people uh, to feel safe uh, because so many people have chosen to be vaccinated. Amanda, do you have any follow-up for that? Yeah, um, on this one, I would say I agree with Ajay. If you are vaccinated, I don't know how, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how much it matters, but for those who are unvaccinated, those rates really do matter. Um, right now, um, people who are unvaccinated really remain unprotected in our communities um, because our rates of vaccination are not high enough to ensure their protection. Um, so people who are unvaccinated are the ones who will be at risk for those outbreaks if they occur, if the levels of vaccination are not high enough. Um, Well-vaccinated people will, re will remain protective. These, these um, vaccines have proven to be incredibly effective at protecting people. Great, one more follow-up question to that. So yeah. you were very clear about you know, the level of risk for unvaccinated people. But if you are vaccinated, could you be at risk about, from getting COVID for someone who isn't vaccinated? You know, so I'll say that uh, if you have a healthy immune system and you've been vaccinated, you probably have very high level protection against 
you know, any exposure to the virus that causes COVID. If you're someone whose immune system is a little weakened, uh, and it's not everybody with a weakened immune system, but when you do have a weakened immune system, there's some, you know, mixed data out there as to how protected you are. And that's where uh, I would suggest anybody who's concerned about whether they have that full protection to talk to their doctor. Uh, but the vast majority of people, you know, do have healthy immune systems and being vaccinated certainly does, you know, keep you uh, very protected. Thank you. If you're just joining us now, welcome. Uh, today's town hall is a conversation with three campus experts helping us talk through questions from campus on where we are now. You can find links for captioning and interpretation listed in the event description below this video. We've been wrapping up a conversation around vaccines and how important they are. And I want to remind folks who are uh, listening in that UHS offers free vaccines. You can go to our main location at 333 East Campus Mall. Um, we're offering vaccines at no cost for anyone from the campus community and greater community, including children ages 12 to 17. Information on the screen right now about how to get linked to free vaccines. So I wanna shift a little bit and I'm gonna um, switch to Sarah and, and ask another commonly asked question. So one question that we're hearing a lot about is best ways to talk to coworkers and students about being comfortable in shared spaces, especially if people that aren't on the same page. So for example, what if I'm vaccinated and still prefer to wear a mask and want other people to wear a mask? How might you start that conversation? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think what um, is coming up for people as we re-enter society, um, for those of us who have been sort of, um, you know, staying uh, socially distanced from most people, is how do we set boundaries with people and what is safe? And I think, you know, I, I can't emphasize enough how important it is to be listening to the health experts um, and to the epidemiologists and the, and the physicians who really understand um, the disease and, and how the virus and how, how we can contract it and how we can, um, you know, stave off the virus. So I want to really emphasize that, that, that I think it's really easy for folks to fall into kind of searching for information anywhere they can find it. And I think just really sticking with the expert advice is, is really essential. Um, I will say that in terms of figuring out how to set boundaries with folks and how to have difficult conversations around setting boundaries, it is critical that we all start off with trying to understand what our own boundaries are. Um, so really spending some time as you re-enter the workplace or, or other public spaces thinking about, okay, how do I feel, how comfortable or uncomfortable do I feel kind of in a, in a closed space with another person if there is, let's say five to six feet between us, is that a place where I'm gonna wanna mask? So that we don't enter situations and um, find ourselves surprised about how we feel in that moment. And of course, there is some level of unpredictability, but I think really spending some time trying to understand what's going to be um, comfortable for you and what's not going to be comfortable for you is really important. I also think that word comfort is a difficult one. You know, we, we do need to figure out what's going to be comfortable for us. And also, we need to be sort of reflecting personally on the fact that things that are different feel uncomfortable at first. And so the reality that we have been not around many people over the last almost year and a half means that being around people is inherently gonna be pretty uncomfortable for most of us. Um, and that doesn't make it bad or um, scary in a, real, in a real way. So we've gotta really figure out what feels safe to me and what is something that I'm kind of afraid of and I need to maybe spend some time figuring out how to work through. Uh, which is going to be really different for everyone based on your own experiences, your background, um, experiences you've had over the last year and a half. So I, I think we need to give each other some space to, to consider that. But as we re-enter into environments with other people, just being aware of what it is that, that you need from people and then really using your voice to focus on this is what I need, not necessarily saying to someone, I need you to put your mask on, but I'm still dealing with some discomfort with this virus and I would feel most comfortable if folks would put their masks on. Um, so really focusing on I statements, which is what we call them in our field. So any mental health trained person on this call is gonna be rolling their eyes at me right now. <laughs> Just find that happens actually to me all the time. Okay, so I'm gonna use an I statement and I'm gonna ask you and Amanda to do a little role play. I'm asking you two to do this because you two are coworkers. So um, let's say, Amanda, you and Sarah are both back in the office many days, which is true. Um, if Sarah were to show up at your office door unmasked and you prefer her to be masked, how might you initiate that conversation? 
Well, I might start it like, um, hi, Sarah, it's so good to see you. Um, you know, right now I'm just starting back in the office and I'm trying to get used to things. I really feel a lot better if uh, people who are kind of in the same room with me wear masks right now. Can we do that? Great, great role play, Amanda. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so that's exactly right. You know, Amanda's focusing on how she feels, focusing on what's going to make her comfortable. And, you know, I think if we all reflect on, on kind of difficult conversations or challenging conversations with people, the more people talk about their own feelings and why they're asking for something, the easier it is for the other person to hear it. So saying, you know, I'm working through this. I would really appreciate it if you would do this uh, for, you know, for me to, to help me and my comfort at this time. I do really want to um, also suggest that folks talk with colleagues now and with supervisors about what kind of sort of what's going to be comfortable back in the office. I, I don't think there's any reason for us to go into this and just sort of see what happens. <laughs> you know, so really setting some ground rules, having conversations as, as staff talking about, you know, what do we need to feel comfortable um, as a baseline? You know, I want to just add something to this and, and take a sort of a step back. So recently I boarded a plane in order to get to a destination to take a vacation. And in that setting, I had to wear a mask. It was required, uh, you know, to do that uh, in the plane, except for when you're eating. And, you know, at my destination, it was California. The culture around mask use is a little different too. And now I'm back. And I, it's interesting. Once when you sort of take that leap, to be in, a, in an environment like an, a crowded airplane, you know, you might assume that, you know, I'm much more comfortable about not wearing masks since I've been in that environment. But actually, I wanna just emphasize that I think context really matters. Uh, if I'm around a lot of kids, for example, who I know are not eligible to be vaccinated, I probably will be wearing a mask just simply because I, I just feel like it's good to be cautious around them so that they're not unnecessarily exposed to a virus that I could be carrying, even though there's, it's unlikely that I am. Or if I'm around people in general who you know, want me to be wearing a mask, I'm gonna have one in my pocket. Other times I feel more confident that I don't need to be wearing a mask, especially when I'm around other people who are vaccinated. So I just wanna make that point that every, con every, every sort of context, every situation is different. Uh, and that may vary week to week. And, once when somebody is comfortable around you, sort of wearing a mask or not, don't assume that that's gonna be their comfort level later on. Things, things will change as we move forward, adjusting to this new, new sort of phase in the, in the pandemic. Thank you. Um, I am going to go back to Sarah because having access to a mental health professional um, and hearing your advice and expertise has been really wonderful. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about, more about decision making. So for most of the pandemic, we were asked to make decisions to look out for one another. And now we're navigating a transition where we're coming back together and have to make personal decisions about risk, like getting vaccinated to protect ourselves. So Sarah, can you talk about how we should be thinking about balancing our personal decisions with our concerns for one another as a community? Yeah, that's a, a, a great and, and big question um, that I think is gonna, is gonna look different for different people. You know, I think um, Ajay alluded to some cultural differences. You know, folks, are, like I said earlier, folks all are coming into, into this with very different backgrounds and experiences and lessons learned in the pandemic um, and perhaps have sur survived other um, major health crises. So I think there's gonna be a lot of uh, variability between people. Um, I, I do think this is a really good opportunity for folks to sort of look at the ways that we can make small adjustments in our behavior to really improve um, not only the, the health, but also just the well-being and the morale of other people. Um, and I think the more we can really approach this as a way to take care of each other, um, you know, there's, there's a, a term that I talk about a lot called community care as opposed to self-care. And I think this is a really great opportunity for us as a, as a university community to think about our sort of global responsibility for creating an environment where people want to show up and want to be and, and feel taken care of. Um, and so I think carrying it, you know, Ajay said, carrying a mask in your back pocket um, and being flexible about its use um, is, is a small way to uh, really make other people feel more comfortable um, 
and and I think create a, an environment that I think is one that we would all prefer to be in, really. Thanks. Um, I really love that term, community care. Amanda, I think you have some follow up ideas about that. Yeah, this one's a this one's a for me a pretty important question. Um, this whole last year, well, I certainly had some concern for myself. Um, worrying about contracting COVID, my largest overriding fear was infecting someone else, was not being able to care for someone who was perhaps at greater risk than I was. That was that was the scariest thing to me, probably because I'm an epidemiologist and in public health. I, I, I just, um, that was really hard. Um, and I know now that I've done the single largest thing that I can do to protect my community, to care for my community, which is go and get vaccinated. That is the number one thing I can do to both protect myself and protect my community. Um, and, and that just has made me, has lifted so much of that fear and anxiety for me. Um, in fact, there there isn't that much more that I can particularly do. I, I've done the largest thing. Um, so beyond this point, um, you know, my goal is really to encourage more people to get vaccinated and then also to think about, I mean, to be really aware and cognizant that other people are in different places in terms of that continued anxiety. It, it didn't come the minute I got vaccinated. That, that didn't happen immediately. It took months, actually, for me to come to the place and for community rates to drop down to a place where that could where I could really feel that um, sense of anxiety lifting um, and that assurance. That, that really I had done it. I had done the thing I the things I had needed to. I had quarantined, I had tested, and now I had vaccinated, and my list was checked off. Um, so what we can really do as a community now is one, be cognizant that people are in different places on that journey. It, it can take a while, and continue to prom to discuss vaccination, to um, talk about it with the people you care about, talk about it with the people that you um you know, our encounter who have questions about it. Um, just try to do our best to get everyone to do the, the biggest thing we can do to protect our community. That is so helpful, thank you. And, and for those who are just joining us now, welcome to our first summer town hall, where we're talking about where we are now. Joined with three campus experts and we're having a conversation about vaccinations, how to talk to colleagues, um, how to really show up at work. And I think, you know, I want to then start, I want to continue with another really commonly asked, I don't know if it's a question, but concern. You know, we talked about how we were able to prevent ourselves from being sick. And I think some people also noticed that maybe during the past 15, 16 months, maybe you didn't even have the common cold. You were able to get through a full season, um, maybe without even some sniffles, minus some allergies. So what's going to happen when we get sick in the future? And if we don't know if it's COVID, how do you all feel like you're going to respond? Um, will you come to work? What's that going to be like the first time? You know, I'll I'll say that I definitely enjoyed last year. My my uh, respiratory tract was healthy, and I appreciated that because I get really annoyed when I have a cold, and when it gets into the lungs, I definitely don't do well. I I prefer not to have them, and. Certainly going back to the workplace and being around people, which I'm already doing now. Um, yeah, at some point, respiratory infections are gonna become common again. Um, and I think if we have symptoms for something that feels like it could be COVID, it's probably not COVID if you're vaccinated. It's probably gonna be rhinovirus or maybe one of the seasonal coronaviruses. And when flu season starts, maybe it's influenza, but there's a vaccine for that too. Um, you know, I think I think one thing that's really important, though, is that if you do have any symptoms um, for anything that's respiratory, uh, stay home. If you think about how things were before the COVID pandemic, you know, it was pretty common for people to come to work, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, symptoms of, of the cold and maybe even worse to sort of gut it out and to still come come to the workplace. And I hope that we don't do that again. Uh, if we do what, if we take sick leave, like as sick leave is intended, uh, stay home. Uh, and you, if you're well enough to work from home, go ahead and do that, right? Uh, but I think it's a respectful thing now to not come to work sick, uh, to not uh, put yourself in a position where you may spread germs to others. 
it may not be COVID if you're vaccinated, but it might be other things. And, and I think we've all gotten used to having healthier lungs in the last year. I think we should continue that. And I think that's another example of um, why mask wearing should continue or could continue, you know, keeping that mask in your in your back pocket. Um, I also want to acknowledge that there have been many employees who have been on campus since the beginning. So some folks have um, had an opportunity to work from home, but there have been many people who've been on campus the entire time. These folks have provided essential services from working with students in residence halls to ensuring that campus remained clean and healthy. Um, do you three have any recommendations or suggestions for how these employees might start to feel comfortable welcoming more people back to campus? Amanda, let's start with you. Well, I think it, it, I'm not sure that I have exactly, I mean, hopefully again, it's the same idea that um, hopefully they've taken the largest step to protect themselves by getting vaccinated. I actually think that these folks um, can really offer a lot of experience, a lot of guidance and wisdom um, in terms of what they learned in terms of assessing risk and um, feeling comfortable and what they needed to do to take care of themselves in situations that may not have felt as low risk as they were accustomed to working with in the past, um, which I think many of us will be returning to in the fall. I know my conversations with colleagues who have been here throughout uh, throughout the whole year have been incredibly useful for me to under to kind of get a sense of how how did they how did they uh, get through this? How did they um, you know what strategies did they use when they were having to make these large adjustments over time? Um, because even those who you know who have been here the whole time at first, it was mostly just employees on campus, and then the students came back to campus. So they've ha they've had to go through these adjustments several times already. They can perhaps they can offer some of what they've learned um, for their colleagues who are reuniting with them. Um, and I, I, I feel confident that, that they've learned a lot of skills over the course of the last year um, that'll really serve them well um, as we move forward. Uh, Sarah, do you have any ideas? Well, that was a really good answer, Amanda. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I think I would just, um, I think relying on, on those folks as the experts of what it's like to be, have, you know, be on campus uh, is a really good idea. I also think just, continuing to give everyone compassion for the fact that this is going to be a big transition for everyone, regardless of whether you've been on campus, you haven't been on campus, you haven't been on campus and you've been home with young children. You know, there are a lot of different scenarios for what the what the day to day work life has been for different folks. Um, and it's going to be a big adjustment for everybody. And even good adjustments are really hard. And so I think um, if we can all kind of think about some big transitions we've been through in the past and how we've dealt with that, what's made it easier, what's made it harder, um, you know, when maybe when you went away to college, um, maybe when you went through uh, a big loss in your life, you know, the big changes are hard. And so thinking about what are the ways that I as an individual can get through things more easily. What has worked for me in the past to help us with this transition? And I think really attending to the fact that regardless of where you've been working or what your arrangement has been over the last, you know, 15 or 16 months, this is gonna be a difference. There's gonna be a lot of change for everyone. Ajay, what do you think? Uh, I mean, I think what Amanda said, um, you know, really, really resonated with me, just listening to people who have been on, at on campus during the whole pandemic and last year. And actually just listening in general to anybody who's got a nugget of wisdom, uh, having more conversations about our adjustments and readjustments, I think is good. Uh, we might find that we have a lot of common perspectives and where our perspectives differ, uh, you know, we can share, share with one another sort of how we feel. Uh, and I think that really promotes uh, an environment of having more respect from where other people are coming from. And, and I think that's important. So we talked about um, what it could feel like to reunite this summer, but another common question that has come up is, could we see outbreaks in the fall? And if so, what does that look like on campus? Amanda, you really focused on the camp campus aspect of this this past 15 months or so. So what are your thoughts here? Hmm. 
that is, that is so, I, it's so hard for me to predict this one. Um, what would it look like? I think it would look far more limited. We have in this county incredible levels of protection um, from our from our vaccine campaign. Um, so it, it doesn't seem like it will be easy for the vaccine to get a real toehold here on campus. Um, I hope that throughout the summer, we'll see more and more of our community uh, continue to get vaccinated. Um, there certainly, I mean, where these outbreaks happen uh, right now are sort of in pockets of folks who are unvaccinated, families, um, maybe smaller workplaces where groups of people are unvaccinated. So I think the possibility for some smaller local outbreaks certainly remain, um, but people can choose uh, to prevent that uh, by getting vaccinated here on campus. So that's my guess, Ajay? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, you're right. I mean, I think uh, there'll be limited transmission, definitely more manageable. Um, transmission won't be eliminated, but I foresee sort of just not being at risk for the same kinds of outbreaks that were occurring before the vaccines became available. You know, definitely around the state, you know, we've got a wide range in what vaccination rates are like. And so we should also just acknowledge that, you know, people affiliated with campus, people who work on our campus, learn on our campus, have family all over the state, all over the country and world, where, you know, rates of transmission may be higher or vaccine coverage is not as high. And so I think we can feel safe here, but I imagine a, a lot of people will still have their minds on, you know, loved ones uh, around the world uh, and what they're experiencing. So Ajay, um, if I can ask you, what about variants? Are those things that we should be concerned about and, and how could that impact campus? Yeah, I mean, so one, the vaccines that are available are effective against the variants that are circulating. And, and this is the topic that researchers are focusing on to make sure that they remain effective. And if there is a time in the future where we have a variant that escapes the immunity afforded by the vaccine. Um, you know, hopefully we'd have a, a, a booster of some kind that could protect us. But that is not something that we have planned at the moment. Um, the vaccines work against the variants and experts are monitoring variants that are circulating around the world and here in Wisconsin and here in Dane County, uh, doing that diligently. and. I think we can rely on them to uh, let us know when we can become more concerned. I think for now, we can remain confident when you're vaccinated. So what I'm really liking about this conversation is we're having a balance of like feeling confident, but also acknowledging the difficult things that we're going through. So I wanna continue with that theme by asking Sarah another question about, you know, really helping people um, feel more secure in some of the changes that are going on. And one of the things, Sarah, that you mentioned earlier is that a lot of people are having also social anxiety. So it's not only anxiety related to other aspects of our lives, but we might not have socialized as much lately. And then we're gonna be coming to work and asked to socialize in new and different ways. Do you have any tips um, or how you can talk to people about managing you know, this re-entry anxiety? Um, anything that you've shared with people, clients, et cetera, during this past 15, 16 months? Sure. So one thing I'm going to do is caution folks to label too much of how they're feeling. You know, I think social anxiety is, is a very um, is a, a very real condition. And I think um, having sort of really reasonable fears and uh, reactions to a big change. I just want to be cautious about kind of di being diagnostic about that. Um, but I will say, you know, anxiety is fear. And so really just thinking about what, what you are worried about, what are you scared about, what are you worried is going to happen, and really kind of working through that personally with family, friends, um, getting the support you need to, to work through that, because it, it's going to look different for all of us. Um, and I really can't emphasize that enough, which is why I keep repeating it. We all have different situations. We all have different um, kind of personal levels of comfort that we've had throughout COVID. So some of us have gone to the grocery store. Some of us didn't go to the grocery store for 10 months. Um, some of us have, you know, vulnerable people um, living with us or that we're in contact with regularly. And so that makes us more nervous. Um, some of us will ride the bus. Some of us can't even imagine riding the bus. So, you know, figuring out for you personally, what are you worried about? What are you afraid of? 
what fears do you have that are based in sort of, you know, medical science and what fears do you have that, that might be beginning to look like they're not totally based in the real facts at this point. Um, and, you know, having some sort of honest reflections about that in order to really gauge um, kind of what support you need going forward. Um, and again, I, I also really want to emphasize that we can be scared of things um, and still do them. And so I think we need to be flexible with ourselves and with each other that like taking a step forward in this, in this next phase is going to feel scary to most of us. Um, and that doesn't make it bad or the wrong thing. Um, but it's, you know, doing a gut check with yourself as you take each step forward. Does this feel okay? Is, does it feel uncomfortable or does it feel very scary to the point that I don't want to take this step? Um, and, you know, figuring out with your supervisors or HR or whoever, if you really need, you know, additional supports in order to, to make sure that, that you are safe and, and feel the kind of safety you need to feel. Thank you. I, I really appreciate those points that you made. Thank you. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about assessing risk. We've talked, we touched on, on that a little bit um, in, in the previous minutes, but how can we assess risk if we have unvaccinated family members? Um, Ajay, do you want to speak to that one first? Yeah, sure. I mean, obviously there's so much emphasis on the importance of vaccination and how effective they are for the individual, but you know, we, we all have family members, loved ones in our households or nearby who we interact with often and some of them may not be vaccinated. They may be eligible and not yet vaccinated, or they just not are not eligible yet for vaccination because they're less than 12 years of age. And I think it's important that we first acknowledge that everybody comes from sort of a household, a family, um, sort of an environment where they may be in close contact with people who are unvaccinated. So they will, they will see risk very differently even if they themselves are vaccinated uh, versus somebody who's coming from, you know, an, a household uh, environment where everybody is, is fully vaccinated. And, and, it, and it, on top of that, there's also just that perception of risk that people will have, it's gonna vary. Uh, and I think it's important that people sort of, you know, think about what they're comfortable with and not comfortable with and acknowledging that others will not have that shared comfort even if they share your vaccination status. Amanda, do you have thoughts on that? Sure. Um, well, when I think about assessing risks, um, I always assume, I, I think it's important if you're talking about risk to talking about, to also talk about the benefits. Um, I, I don't think any of us undertake risky things um, without assuming that they offer us some benefits. That, that would be strange. Um, and so we all make choices every day. Uh, we get in cars and we do that instead of biking because it gets us there faster. Um, that's the benefit that we're reaping from a slightly more risky um, endeavor. Um, we, we all make these choices every day. And so when we're thinking about these risks, well, these decisions, our decisions over the course, my decisions over the course of the last year have been so difficult because it's been so difficult to gauge the amount of risks that we were taking in any situation. We've gained so much more information about that. And the risk has become so much more marginal for people who are vaccinated. It is so much lower that those little levels of risk that we had to differentiate between um, over the course of the past year are not as those are not as big of differences and so we can uh, begin to make more solid assessments of whether or not the benefits of certain activities will be worth it to us and i know for me that's changed dramatically um the value of spending time with um friends family co-workers of um you know <laughs> little things like being able to look at a you know look at a computer screen with another person right standing right there um, and move things along a little bit quicker. Those are things we've started to do um, in safe ways. Um, and when we, when it's important, when it's valuable to do. And those decisions I think are something we're gonna continue to, to make over the course of time. And really risk is also so personal and the, and the value of various benefits are so personal to you. Um, how, 
I have to make my risk based on my own personal, um, you know, health information that I have about myself. And the benefits also are really something that's really personal to me. How much does it matter to me to, um, you know, spend time with my loved ones or how much value will that give to me? Those are things you can really only define for yourself um, and sometimes with the help of your uh, personal physicians. Thank you. And, and Amanda, you, you did share a little bit earlier about um, how we can be how we can personally start to feel a little bit more comfortable being around people again. Mm -hmm. I'd like to hear from the other panelists. Are there other things you've done to start feeling more comfortable? Sarah, I'll ask you to go first. Yeah, I'll say, you know, I think um, starting to go in if for those folks who have not been going to your offices, I think starting to um, sort of desensitize a little bit and spend a little bit of time in your office, um, on campus. Um, and certainly you could do this in, in other parts of your life too, but, you know, beginning to dip your toe in the water in terms of doing the things you haven't been doing, um, particularly, you know, as long as you can wear a mask if you're uncomfortable or you can socially distance, do things outside with people. But that is part of how we how we re-enter is to begin to start to do things. And I've certainly been been doing that. Um, I have found that it's really helpful to go into my office and feel like I can, like Amanda said, you know, I can understand the benefits of it and it feels good and it feels worth um, whatever level of, of risk there is, although I will say I am vaccinated. Um, so I think starting to do that, you know, I myself have not gotten on a bus yet, um, but that is on my mind as something I would like to do soon. Um, I, I will wear a mask. Um, I have been in closed spaces with people who are vaccinated and that has felt comfortable. I wasn't sure how that would feel, but, um, an elevator, for example. Um, so I, you know, I think it's, it's just been testing things out and seeing how it goes. Um, so I don't know, Ajay, if you have anything to add. Yeah, I mean, I've already sort of shared that I was on a plane and I went on vacation and, and I've been in a lot of environments around people, been on the terrace, uh, got together with coworkers, uh, you know, not wearing a mask because I, I'm vaccinated and I felt comfortable, you know, not wearing a mask. That's was fine for me. Also going to the store, uh, sort of returning to sort of pre-pandemic kinds of activities. And I'll say, uh, not so i'm sort of that person who has was willing to kind of sort of rip that band-aid off in a sense and just sort of you know start to do things as normal um and i would monitor my symptoms and i still do uh i feel good uh despite sort of going back to being around people and sometimes in crowded situations um you know i'm not feeling sick it gives me more confidence really on a daily basis that the vaccines are working or my exposure is just very low because we don't have a lot of COVID in Dane County right now. Uh, so that's kind of you know how I feel. Amanda, what about you? Well, I just think one more thing is that you might make a mistake. Like I, I know that at some point or another, I, I ended up in a situation where I thought, oh, this is a little more risky than I had hoped it would be. Um, you know, that's why we carry our masks. That's why we um, have them and get out of them as quickly as possible and learn from those. Uh, just just to note, like those will happen and those will be teaching moments that tell us when we've maybe moved a little too fast um, and we can kind of revisit them maybe when it feels a little safer for us. So who should people talk to if they're still feeling uncomfortable about some of the changes that they're being asked to confront? I, I definitely wanna hear from all three of you. Um, Sarah, do you wanna take this one first? Yeah, so, and I'll speak as a manager, you know, I think that um, <laughs> go to somebody else. No, I'm just kidding. Um, you know, speak with your manager. I, you know, creating. I think it's really important for us to figure out. You know, um, how to what people are going to need to feel like they could do their jobs comfortably um, at this point. I am certainly, in terms of my department, we are approaching the fall as a as a pilot. It's going to be a little bit different than things have been in the past, and we want to do it in a way that's going to. Um, be comfortable enough for for folks to to feel like they can do their jobs. Um, so I would say, you know, talk with your supervisor and give them a chance to see if there's something that can be sort of negotiated in terms of get come, having you start to come in sooner alone, so or something like that, where you can start to get used to the space um, before everyone has returned. Uh, so I think. That's where I would really hope that folks start um, having conversations with colleagues and in small groups among, you know, shared staff around, you know, what 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 things can we do to support each other 
uh, in this process would be really helpful before, for me before you go to um, necessarily a, a more formal accommodation. Amanda, what do you think? I, I guess I think all of Sarah's suggestions are incredibly um, important. Sometimes, like I said, our the risks and the and our concern about them really can only be addressed personally. And, and that's why I wouldn't be afraid to talk to your uh, physician. Um, if you have some specific concerns, some specific worries, um, they'll be far more <laughs> prepared to address them than I as a supervisor, for example, would be. Um, if you have really specific health care, I, I think there can be an incredible resource. Ajay? Yeah, I mean, so I, I have a you know a close circle of friends and, and family members who I trust uh, when I need advice on anything that's personal, uh, also including like how to stay safe. I sometimes find myself in a position where people come to me for uh, advice. And so um, I feel like I need to be around expertise and uh, expert information just so I can also provide that for other people. But Really, it's uh, having that trusting relationship and relying on that. Thank you. Um, so we're coming to the more tail end of the hour. And Amanda, Sarah, Ajay, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. I'm lucky that I get to learn from each of you every day. And I'm so grateful that you've been willing to share your expertise and thoughtfulness with campus. Um, as we come to a close, I do have the same question for all three of you. And I want to ask all three of you, what are you looking um, forward to the most this summer? Amanda, can you go first? Oh, what am I not looking forward to? Um, I'm uh, so excited to get back to so many aspects of life um, from as simple as playing cards with people when the day's too hot outside or too windy outside to play cards outside um, to um, seeing my uh, kids, my relatively newly vaccinated kids re-engage in their lives um, and the kinds of things they like to do. Um, and I'm looking forward to what it's going to be like as we start, as I start re-engaging with my coworkers in uh, new ways, um, being able to re-engage with my non-COVID focused work. Um, yeah, so many things. What about you, Sarah? Well, if you ask what I'm looking forward to this summer, it's got nothing to do with any of this, but <laughs> I'll answer what I think you're asking. You know, the, the last 15 or 16 months have just been really hard for a lot of people. Um, and, you know, there's been a lot written about it uh, around the idea of languishing and how people are just struggling. And I'm really, I know that the reentry and the transition is going to be hard for people. Um, but I feel really excited about what comes sort of immediately after that. I think there's a lot to be hopeful about. You know, there's there's this, we have all this new information and we can continue gathering information about how the workplace could be, you know, more convenient or, you know, a nicer place to be. Um, and so I'm really excited to incorporate that into a re-entry plan where we get to be around each other and get to be um, sort of, have our cups filled up instead of just depleted um, all the time, which I think has been the experience that a lot of people have had working remotely. Um, so, so really looking forward to just using the new information to, to make things better than they were before. And you might have to tell us later um, what some of those plans are <laughs> if you're not willing <laughs> to share them here. Ajay, what about you? I mean, so personally, I'm looking forward to doing some more travel, uh, seeing family, seeing friends uh, and doing that just you know, it's, it's part of summer in Madison is to just to be outdoors and, and do those things. And I think returning to work, I'm looking forward to being around students again. I, I think uh, you know, some of my students, you know, definitely have struggled just learning in isolation. And it'd be nice to go back to seeing them in my office and, and being in a classroom and just sort of return to teaching, uh, you know, just in that sort of way that this, I think sometimes can be more effective. I think everything I learned about doing things remotely, I'm going to cherry pick all those things that worked out really well and continue some of those things, but then go back to, you know, being part of a vibrant, you know, campus environment uh, because I miss that. 
I really enjoyed this time with the three of you. And again, I'm so fortunate that I get to talk to the three of you every day. Um, so thank you for sharing your knowledge, your wisdom, your thoughts, and, and your jokes with, with us today. Um, as a reminder, this is the first of three town halls with additional ones planned for July and August. We're also working on a series of videos that answer some more commonly asked questions and tackle some of the difficult questions we're facing together. Please stay tuned for those. The link for today's session will remain active on this YouTube page and posted on the COVID-19 response website. Please continue to monitor the COVID-19 response website for the latest information and in FAQs and your inbox from updates for the chancellor and your HR representative. Again, I thank Amanda, Ajay, and Sarah for a wonderful conversation. Please reach out. Remember that we're here for you. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you.